From youngest professor in Germany to state secretary to editor-in-chief of Germany's largest business publication, our next speaker, Dr. Miriam Meckel, will share her story on how the climb to the top can really get a woman down. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Miriam Meckel. Hello, everybody. Woo, that's, that's the setting here. It's really impressive, and I have to admit it's also kind of scary, looking down from the stage uh, onto you all. Woo, this is really, really a situation. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here, and I would like to, to say to you, Madam President, thank you, Kathy, for inviting me. Thank you, Kathy and Mary, for helping and, and preparing and supporting me in advance. That's really a great event. And as I've learned that this is the ninth Women's Leadership Forum, it's really um, in my heart to just uh, think it's, uh, it's worth a big round of applause for Kathy and Mary. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm trying to, to play a little bit with the nice uh, play of words, history, her story, because the role of women in society today has a lot to do with history, and the development of our role is still something we need to think about. And I would like to do this by sharing with you my story of trying to get together the intellectual approach uh, to a world that opens up a lot of opportunities, and the emotional approach, which is very, very important, but you need, to, you, you need to get there and you need to take it. So let's get going. There is one specific moment when I was a little child that I still remember very clearly. It was a Saturday afternoon, a long time ago, when I was four or five years old. My mother and I were sitting in the dining room and she was playing solitary at the table. And I remember myself very clearly being squeezed into the chair right next to hers, trying to slowly cuddle up to be near her. What strikes me is that I can perfectly remember, conjure up the image from my view, me watching her from a lower angle, trying to get closer. That is one of the rare moments I clearly remember from my childhood. I was fully aware as a child that I wanted to be close to my mother, I wanted to be hugged and held, and it was not a given that this would happen, because it generally happened rarely. Not because my parents were cold-hearted people, not because they didn't care about me, it was because they didn't know better. They had never learned to accept and express that there is a second emotional layer to each and every person. That a human being is more than the representation of their existence in society and in business life. That letting the individual emotional layer be a part of your life is a, is a sign of strength and not a sign of weakness. As a child, I intuitively understand, I didn't intuitively, intuitively understand the meaning of that situation I was just describing to you. It has actually taken me decades to really get the message. And the message is, if you miss out on your emotional life, you somehow miss out on your life generally. In the generation of my parents, you needed to refrain from emotions, to do what, ex what was expected of you, to stick to the rules of the societal game of that time, which was to compose yourself, to swallow what might come up as a feeling and might get in the way of your normal daily life, the routines that guaranteed you'd be a part of the new normality after war, which meant being unobtrusive, being inconspicuous, and it also somehow meant being invisible in society. There is a phrase from the novel The Bell Jar by the wonderful Sylvia Plath, who, by the way, was born in Boston, and this phrase goes, the silence depressed me. It, was the si it wasn't the silence of silence, it was my own silence. 
There was not a lot of physical affection in my family, neither between my parents nor between them, my sister and me. If you wanted to be close, you needed to work hard for it. It happened rarely, and it mostly felt somehow awkward. There was no point in trying to learn to open up emotionally, as it was a huge endeavor, potentially an embarrassment, and so you'd just better let it go. Why am I telling you this little story? Because I acted like the child of my parents for a huge part of my life. Today, I am still their child, but something important has changed. And that was my personal tipping point. After decades of a life ruled by adaption of sorts, I started to reframe the relationship between my intellectual and my emotional self. And this is my story as one tiny part of the history of the war generation's children. Most of our parents never learned to open up about their emotions, to let them guide their lives, or at least sometimes be a discernible part of it. Life was hard enough. It was all about survival, about feeling hungry, cold, and displaced. There was no space to express your feelings. So they suppressed their emotions, and with that, almost everything that makes a person a lifelong, surprising encounter, a complex endeavor, and a fascination. What we have seen of the generation of the children of war, the generation of my parents, is to a large extent an abstract version of their wholesome selves. It's a map, it's not the territory. By growing up as the daughter and sons of the children of the war, a lot of people from my generation have adapted to the map and neglected the vast and rich territory of their individual selves and the major influence the generation of our parents had on them. And that is true for me as well. As my parents never learned to deal with their emotions, to accept and nourish them, I hadn't learned it either. I actually needed to turn 42 years old to understand that the mind and the soul and the body are a human trinity that cannot be torn apart or just ignored. Maybe some of you know from Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that there is only one ultimate answer to life, the universe, and everything. And this answer is 42. <laughs> that is, of course, total nonsense and nevertheless brilliant because it consolidates my argument in one figure, 42. A deliberate setting, nobody knows why it is 42, but everybody deals with it without questioning it. That's the map the generation of my parents stuck to. A social setting, discomforting in lots of ways, nonsense, but still unchallenged. When I turned 42, I had a breakdown. That is a coincidence, and it has nothing to do with Douglas Adams but I have thought about this coincidence for quite a while, I can tell you, because I was looking for answers. This breakdown might have been due to much too much work. It might have been due to a feeling of being displaced while having traveled the world excessively for business and other things. It was certainly due to my perfect strategic ignorance towards my feelings, particularly the grief that struck me after my mother died. That was the moment when everything somehow came together. The ineptitude and helplessness to deal with emotions, the silence related to that, the loneliness that arises from that silence. It took my mother eight weeks from falling ill to dying of cancer. And again, there was only one moment in those days and weeks I spent at her bedside, where emotions ran free. I don't want to die yet, she said, and took my hand. 
one sentence at the end of a lifetime. That is very, very sad. There are lots of maps we can rely on when extraordinary situations challenge our daily routines. The 10 rules of grief, how to cope with exhaustion, a guidebook for the experienced. That's what I did during those days, months, years afterwards. I stuck to the map of best dealing with grief and other kinds of exhaustion, a map drawn by other people. I tried to cover up myself with that map, but it still felt very, felt very, very cold, because it didn't fit me. So what had happened until my 42nd birthday? I always thought I was running like a fine-tuned machine. You know that phrase from, other, from another context, I guess. But there was no fine-tuned machine. It actually took enormous amounts of energy to suppress what I felt and feared and longed for. My soul became calloused, and I grew more and more distant and unreachable for my partner, my family, and my friends. We are all taking lots of decisions every day, trying to be purely rational, trying to cast aside the impact of our emotions on those decisions. But often, those decisions are simply fake news from the left part of our brains. For more than 40 years of my life, I was stuck in the left hemisphere of my brain, more or less. And I tell you, it was a fight, not a life. The breakdown was my personal tipping point. It was a horrible experience I will hopefully never need to go through again. But it was also life-saving. There was something good about it, actually. I began to understand that I want and need to be more than the map of myself, more than a representation of somehow who perfectly fits into the pattern of other people's expectations. When I started to do that, my life started to change. I began to allow myself and others to explore my territories. I granted myself emotional complexity and compassion. And last year, I got married to my wonderful girlfriend of 15 years, something I thought I would never do. I started living wholeheartedly. Let me take you back to the little memory of my childhood. You remember me sitting at the table with my mother playing cards? Between that very moment and today, I have learned a lot of things about my mother that she never talked about. How fitting, for example, that she was playing solitaire, as she was, in fact, a painfully solitary person. I'm not sure how self-aware she was of her life as a woman compared to a man back in those days, compared to my father, for example. There was a huge difference. My father had a job and went to work. My mother stopped doing so after my sister had been born. My father had a wide-ranging social life with friends and colleagues. My mother did the housekeeping. She sometimes saw some friends, but expectations clearly differed. My mother had to bear the burden of two major societal restrictions in her life, disrespect for emotions and disrespect for women. While many things have changed with regards to how women can participate in life, have their own careers and family, and rise to a leadership position, that was not true for my mother. And it wasn't even self-evident when I grew up and started my professional life. I had to fight for it, and so I did. Out of self-respect. Because I wanted to be the one to change that situation. I wanted to be respected as a woman in each and every way a man was respected. And I wanted to take all the chances a man would be allowed to take. I can imagine that everybody in this room knows in some shape or form what I'm talking about. 
It is a deeply emotional challenge to fight for your rights because it touches the core of your identity. Why are you not granted something other people are granted? Why not? It's deeply emotional. And people in the US know even more and better about it than I do. Native Americans, the blacks and Hispanics, queers and people with disabilities, they have taught the American people and people all over the world the meaning of fighting for your own dignity with all the ups and severe downs of the experience. And women had to fight too in this country. They continue to have to do so. Just think of Hillary Clinton. She might have made a lot of mistakes during the campaign. She might have missed out on really connecting to the people she was trying to convince to vote for her. But there is one other thing. Think of the question that overshadowed her whole election campaign. How is a woman aiming at the top political position in this country when the rules are as follows? Don't be dominant because people will judge you as unwomanly and unlikable, first of all. Don't be weak because people will judge you as a whiner and unfit for office. What's left there for you as a woman? There's no way to solve the conflict. You are simply trapped. To understand that you hardly have a choice is a deeply disturbing and very emotional experience. It would have been healthy to recognize and handle it as such, also for me, but I didn't. I thought of it as a strategic challenge I could tackle with my left brain hemisphere alone, the rational one. And when I sat in my little apartment one day crying over the fact that competitors tried to outmaneuver me from the next step on the ladder, I just decided to work more and fight harder. That strategy might lead to success, but it comes at a price. I started to develop a counterphobic attitude. Don't avoid the challenges you can barely stand. Face them actively and almost embrace them aggressively. That was my strategy. And even that might work out for a while, but it leads to total exhaustion, like my tipping point at 42. Women have gained and acquired a lot but there is still something missing for us that lies behind some other tipping point. We need to reach that point. In the course of the progress we have made, we managed to turn equality into a rational choice issue, but it's not. Let me frankly tell you from my experience, my personal experience, how that feels. The moment you realize you need to be better to reach your goals, you need to work harder to do so. You need to explain more and you will face rejection. That is a very emotional moment. And that is an insight the early feminist movement has offered us. But we somehow have unlearned it again. Today, a lot of women, I know that from a lot of personal experiences and talks about this issue, a lot of women try to deal with that situation by reducing cognitive dissonance, a rational strategy again. You feel that the situation is not how you'd like it to be. You reasonably decide to arrange yourself with the disadvantages that still prevail in your professional and private life because it hurts so much to admit that they are still there. Dealing with it from all our hearts means constant pain. That is true. It hurts severely because it's all about you as an individual personality with all her curiosities, capacities, and compassion. But it is also hugely rewarding and also necessary because what you gain is a wholesome version of all those curiosities, capacities, and compassion. A wholesome version of yourself. We as women have gained respect and tolerance, but what we need and deserve is unreserved acceptance. 
Acceptance means that there is no difference between a roadmap to equality and the reality of a life that cherishes equality for all individuals. Again, we face the distinction between map and territory. The map is omnipresent. Women's advancement, legislation on equal rights and opportunities, but the territory behind the map, the territory that's related to the map, is still partly uncharted. And I guess currently we need to state it faces renewed upheaval. What we are experiencing from the first week of the new US president and his government signals a reversal of many parts of the map to equality. What are we to do? Grab our chances by the pussy? That's probably not what we all mean by exploring our opportunities. <laughs> I have to admit, I find it disconcerting that at this point in time, when women have started to reconcile the map and the territory of their respective selves and their roles in society, business and politics, a backlash looms again. So, let's turn it into a positive perspective. It's time, the time has come to firmly stand our ground. Feminism is not just a rational choice. It's deeply emotional, it's a deeply emotional movement. A fight for acceptance and a fight for inclusion. And it is worth every endeavor, every resistant move and every tear related to it. I have personally benefited so much from the generation before me and everything they have achieved. Let's not stop here. Let's not just draw maps of formalized equality. Let's enter the territory with our hearts and our souls and both hemispheres of our brains. The map is not the territory. That's the famous quote by the American philosopher Alfred Krzyzewski. What does he mean by it? Basically, that an abstraction derived from something, a landscape or a person, is not the thing itself. Words, by the way, are maps too. We are extremely talented in using a huge map of words to protect our territory from the sight of others says, by the way, a woman currently giving a speech and doing this for a living sometimes. <laughs> but still, it's true. Anyone who really wants to get to know somebody needs to figure out what's behind the map, needs to dare to wander the territory, to experience the hills and valleys, learn about the ditches, explore uncharted fields. And by the way, this is not just related to the other people. It's even more true for ourselves. You've never spent time in the darkness just by yourself. You've never tried testing your boundaries. Then you'll never be familiar as a wanderer of your own territory. I have to admit, all this took me quite a long while, 42 years. So I am for sure not a role model in quick self-analysis. But I have learned a lot these years, and I won't miss them. I wouldn't like to miss them, actually. I no longer miss out on my emotional self, and I've started to live wholeheartedly. And for those of you still looking out for the tipping point, I'd like to leave you with the ending paragraph of the Canadian poet Oriah's piece, the invitation, and please take it as one. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.